Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Amir Karam, board certified facial plastic surgeon and founder of Karam MD Skin. I specialize in facial rejuvenation, which basically means I help people look as young as they feel. And today we're gonna to talk about a very important topic that comes up a lot in a lot of questions surrounding this, and I'm gonna to try to help clarify what are the best lasers that can be used for hyperpigmentation of the skin. But before we jump into the treatments, I'm gonna set it up by explaining a little bit about how hyperpigmentation is formed and what are the different types of hyperpigmentation because that's really going to inform whether or not a laser is even a meaningful option or whether it should actually be something to avoid. This is very important, so you wanna stay tuned for that. And also on a bigger scale, how can you really keep hyperpigmentation down and keep it from coming back even after you've had laser treatments? So a lot of information in this video, a lot of information that's highly useful. So stay tuned and stay with us as we uh, break this down and uh, get all the information out. So let's start off with how hyperpigmentation is formed, what are the underlying reasons. So basically sun damage is your typical culprit for hyperpigmentation. What ends up happening is the sun's ultraviolet rays is specifically the UVA category and to some degree UVB get absorbed by the skin. And once they get absorbed by the skin, the melanocytes, which are deep into the dermis of the skin, will take up some of that solar energy in a way protecting the skin, right? Now, the problem is when we are young, there's a lot of protective activity going on on a biochemical level at the, le at the skin. Antioxidant effects, skin repair, collagen production, all this stuff is really ramped up. But the, the accumulation of all that sun energy over a lifetime really starts to manifest when we get older because the skin's defenses start to reduce in activity. And as a result, what you start to see is, in addition to all the other aging changes that happen to the skin, you're also starting to see the melanocytes starting to secrete more melanin pigment into the skin. So what you start to see as the melanin pigments start to form in numbers, you start to see them coalescing into basically dark spots on the surface of the skin. And these migrate from the deep dermis all the way up to the epidermis. So what you end up seeing when you look at somebody who's had years and years of sun exposure, you start to see discoloration in the skin in the way of sunspots and dark spots. The thing is, some of us have darker skin type and lighter skin type. All these will have a different effect in terms of what the um, amount of sun damage will be, but ultimately know that any skin type, whether darker skin, lighter skin, etc., will have to some degree this mechanism of occurring. And you start to really see it years and years after the, the sun has, has affected. Now, that's sun damage, and that's kind of the, the way sun damage starts to, to affect. So there's beautiful tans that we get, you know, especially in my era, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. When we were kids, everyone was sunbathing, everyone was, was getting these beautiful sun-kissed skin. All of those people, by the time they're in their 40s and 50s, now are starting to see sunspots, right? But at that point, it was just beautiful tan skin. We've learned our lesson there, right? So everyone is aware that Excess sun can cause skin damage, um, both in terms of aging, but also skin cancers. So now there's a whole movement around sun protection using uh, sunblocks and sun avoidance to some degree. The beautiful thing about that is that the younger person who's listening to this, if you take on that lifestyle, wear broad spectrum sunblock, wear hats, try to avoid as much sun you know, on your face as possible, you're effectively, probably not gonna have this problem as so much when you get older, right? So you're, you're in a way can pre prevent this. For all of us who've, who've gone through this and we're at a place in life where that is now no longer the case and we're starting to see the dark spots, so let's talk about how we can manage that. But before we do, let's just quickly define another type of hyperpigmentation called melasma. Now melasma is not necessarily related to years and years of sun exposure and creation of, of dark spots. Melasma oftentimes has its origins in hormonal changes, in just genetics, in different things that 
create a different type of hyperpigmentation. They're large plaques throughout the skin that are very responsive to sun, but aren't necessarily originated from sun. You know, we see this a lot with people who are on birth control pills, who have different types of hormonal patterns. And as a result, you see melasma. Why melasma is important to differentiate, and this is why I think it's super important to make sure you define which, which condition you have, because melasma is not really treatable with lasers. In fact, many lasers can make melasma worse, whereas sun damage, hyperpigmentation, dark spots from sun, can absolutely be remedied by the lasers that I'm about to talk about. So this is an important point I want you to really understand and, and if you need to, go see a dermatologist, really define which one you have before you jump into you know, laser treatments and all this kind of stuff. I'm planning on having a whole discussion on melasma, which I know affects many of you, including my wife, and I have some very um, you know, strong opinions on, on how to manage that. Um, but let's go back to the lasers. Let's talk about what lasers are ideal for it. In my mind, there's two categories of lasers that really affect, in a positive way, sun damage. Number one is the category of the um, IPLs and BBLs. So intense pulse light, BBLs, broadband light, depending on the company that's making them, they're gonna be called these two different things. We use BBL because we use a Cyton device in our practice, and as a result, BBL is our treatment of choice for that category. And what it does basically is, this is not a true laser, but it's more of a light that gets absorbed by the melanin pigment and effectively breaks up the melanin pigment, right? So that's, the dark spots get darker, starts to break out in like coffee ground look, and then it becomes absorbed. And once that happens, the pigments that are within the range that the light can penetrate all get uh, affected. Now, there's two pieces to understand when it comes to IPLs, and I'm just gonna call it IPLs just to make it simple. IPLs, number one is the pigment is constantly traveling. It's going from, from deeper to more shallow. So you're not gonna get all of it in one treatment because there's gonna be new ones that are gonna be coming out the second the, the, um, the superficial ones are gone. So typically treatments are done in succession, anywhere from three to five to seven treatments, and that allows for the migration of new pigment to come up, but in addition, any inefficiency in the treatment will, will get cleaned up by the next treatment. So the first treatment is always gonna get the most amount of pigment, the second one will be less and less and less, until finally you have, for the most part, a significant improvement in the skin. Now BBL, generally speaking, requires a few less treatments just because of the way it, the technology is. It's three to five treatments normally. But keep in mind that you need to do them, not one, but several in order to get the real result. And so many times people make the mistake of just going in for one treatment and they're like, yeah, that was like a little bit of an improvement, but not the improvement that I was hoping for. So that's really, really important. The other category of, tr of treatment is resurfacing, right? Remember we said these pigments come up from the deep dermis, they land in the epidermis and upper dermis, and any type of a laser that's gonna go through and literally wipe away the skin that houses that pigment is going to make the skin clear. So we see great results with resurfacing treatments as well. Now, they don't have to be super deep. Anything that's in that epidermal layer can come off. It doesn't have to be like a two month recovery in a deep, deep laser. So micro laser peels, superficial depth laser peels are very, very helpful in that way. I like Erbium YAG personally because it's much more specific in its area of, of ablation as opposed to CO2, which can create a lot of heat in throughout the skin and allow the skin to be a lot more red and inflamed post, post treatment. So Erbium YAG, ideal for somebody who's conscious of recovery. Now for the CO2 lasers, what a lot of people have done, when I say a lot, I mean the industry has done, is they fractionated the laser because it's very hard to recover from a full field CO2 laser resurfacing. So fractionated lasers, basically like Fraxel in the category of Cyton, which is the halo, or Profractional, which is also a Cyton laser. These fractionated lasers will also improve pigment, but keep in mind, anytime you're fractionating a laser, you're only treating a portion of the skin at the same time, right? So it's, it's you know, for example, in the case of Halo or Profractional, which is, I'm, I'm very familiar with, those are anywhere from like 10 to, you know, 20% of the skin surface is getting treated in one, one setting. So that leaves 80% of it that never even sees the light therapy. So as a result of that, what you need to keep in mind is that you need several treatments of those as well, generally speaking, to get the best result. 
but fractionated laser have the advantage of being shorter recovery, easier to, to get through because you're not treating everything at one time. But the consequence of that is you need to have multiple treatments. So to summarize as far as lasers, IPLs, direct treatment for, for brown spots, full field resurfacing, depending on the, how much downtime you have, it will determine how, what the depth should be with an erbium YAG laser. And then the fractionated variety can be multiple treatments, a lot of different names in it, but at the end of the day, it's hitting and breaking up the pigment in the same way that we just described. So those are your three laser categories that you can treat. Now, this is the really important part. If you have melasma, many of these treatments could absolutely make the melasma worse. So it's very, very important to understand. And I've made this mistake myself. I've treated patients who I wasn't 100% clear on whether they had melasma or not. They look like hyperpigmentation from sun damage. And we did a full field laser resurfacing, even though it wasn't super um, deep, it still created a worsening of the melasma, darkening of the melasma, and the patients obviously are very upset about the fact that their skin looks worse after laser, not better. And this is a very, very important thing, and very few technicians really understand how to manage the settings to be able to treat melasma well with IPL or BBL without worsening it. And I would just say, in general, it's not worth it. And because the underlying reason for the why it's happening is completely different and you're not gonna improve it fundamentally, so why even try and take the risk? So melasma, personally not a fan of laser treatments. Take it or leave it, you know, listen to your dermatologist, et cetera, ultimately, but this is my perspective on it. Now, this is where it gets super interesting and I want you to really, really understand this part. Think about leaves on a, on a tree falling during autumn, right? Leaves are falling, you go through, you look at the bottom of your, your tree and there's all these leaves. So what do you do? You go through and you clean it all up. That's your laser treatment. But what happens next week? You come back, there's more leaves because more leaves fell. So you come back and do it again, again and again. Now, ultimately, obviously in this analogy, there's no more leaves to fall, but in the skin, there's always more pigment being produced. And every time you go in with a laser, you're swiping away all this, all this pigment, but there's more pigment that's being produced because the underlying on switch for those melanocytes to produce melanin has not been turned off. That is where skincare comes into the picture and why it's so critical in terms of managing pigment production. And I think a lot of people don't really think of it this way. This paradigm is super important <clears throat> because what you're doing when you are suppressing melanocyte production of melanin is you're preventing the leaves from falling in the first place, right? So therefore you don't have to go under and clean up. And to be perfectly honest with you, a major, major reason why I developed the CaramMD trifecta, why I formulated it to include a pigment controlling component was because you can't really have young looking skin if you have pigments all over the skin. I mean, that's just not what young skin looks like. Clarity and uniformity of the skin is super important. So for example, what I did included in the, um, in the trifecta, vitamin C is a major suppressor of melanocyte production. Retinol is a major suppressor. And a non-hydroquinone lightener. And why it's important to point out non-hydroquinone, because hydroquinone is a prescription drug used as a, as a uh, melanocyte suppressor. Fantastic, right? I mean, it, it does, it works really, really well at the cellular level. The problem is you can't be on it for like more than six months at a time, or else there's consequences in the skin and, and, and possible even high, rebound hyperpigmentation that can happen. So normally people get on cycles, but what happens when you're off of it? Will the pigments start to um, come back again? So I'm not a big fan of hydroquinone as a foundational component, but we included non-hydroquinone lighteners in the trifecta so that it, in addition to vitamin C and retinol, suppresses melanocyte production, dampens the signal. That in combination with sun protection, what you're doing is you're preventing more and more pigment from coming to the surface, which is hugely important. In fact, one of the things that I remember one of our patients said to me was on the dot, every three months she was getting her IPL or BBL. When she's been on the, the trifecta for about a year or so, she says she forgot to make those appointments because her skin looks so good. She stopped making her laser appointments. Now, I'm not saying that there's no place for lasers when you're on good skincare, but honestly, once between the two of them, you get things under control and you're suppressing melanocytes and you're controlling the amount of sun your skin's getting, 
guess what? I really anticipate you're gonna probably need these lasers less and less and less. But in the meantime, to get things under control and to be able to handle um, the, the bigger picture and, and really improve things, these lasers that I mentioned are the lasers that you want to consider as part of your general routine and regimen for pigment control. Now, if you don't wanna do skincare, you don't wanna do that aspect, then here's what I would say. Every three months to four months, you go in and you get your IPL or BBL, it's basically to sweep away more pigment. Between treatments, more will come, you tr treat them away, that's another way you can manage things. All right, folks, that's the story of hyperpigmentation and lasers and bonus skincare. So I hope all that made sense to you. I hope all that put the picture together and gives you the foundation to go forward and do the best things you can for your skin. All right, folks, thank you so much. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer all of them. And uh, if you haven't already, hit subscribe, hit like, and, uh, and share this with some friends and family. Help get the word out. I think this is good, some good stuff for everyone. All right, folks, thanks so much. Dr. Amir Karam.